Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another Thursday evening of uh, cocktails and spirits. And Makers and, and all sorts of fun stuff. And a night of fun. Um, as you're filtering in here, um, we're going to throw up a poll so you can kind of let us know what you're enjoying tonight. What you're sipping on. Um, and uh, we'll give everybody a few minutes to arrive here before we get started. So uh, thanks for joining to, us, everyone. We're excited yeah, to have you here. Thanks and right on time, here. such a timely bunch. We're all ready to drink gin. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> Do you want to maybe while we're waiting for people to settle in, make us a cocktail and tell people what you're making us with our sure. feature products? That sounds like a fun time. Um, let's get a couple And for of those of you, so going. you know, um, we have Venice up here from Simple Goodness Sisters. Venice, if you could give us a wave. Um, and then where it says Kara, it's actually oh. Alex. And so <laughs> that's, that's Alex from 1 8 Distilling here, too. So they'll be chatting with us all evening, which we're excited about. Yeah, and as you join, we're gonna give a little bit of tech tips um, in a few minutes, just to make sure everyone knows their way around and knows how to use Zoom and all that good stuff. But if you wanna throw in the chat where you're joining us from, it's always fun to see where everyone is. And if you wanna throw in the chat too, what you're sipping on, um, that's fun as well. Let me see if I can turn that waiting room off now. I think I can. Somewhere. Oh, it looks like I can't. I'm going to have to keep inviting people. All right. Oh, interesting. Maybe because I locked the option and the settings. Mm. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Venice, hey. Glad you're able to join us. I see here that you've got your uh, video swapped or your account maybe swapped with your. Yeah, sister. I retitled the name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, now we're right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a name swap thing going on here today. We should switch cameras and then <laughs> you can be me and I can That's be That's right, you. totally. Well, I can rename here, I think. And, uh, oh, yeah, oh. you can rename yourself. So if you're. <laughs> Perfect. So we're going to mix up some cocktails while we get started here. Um, as you're joining, throw in the chat where you're joining us from and also throw in the chat what you're sipping on. We would love to see. Laura's from the DC area. Great. That's where 1-8 Distilling is. I bet Laura knows that, huh, uh -huh. Laura? <laughs> There's someone from our neck of the woods too. Oh, Elizabeth yeah, is from Buckley. Yeah. Um, Laura, Laura's drinking the uh, the Ivy City gin too. Yeah, I love it. Columbus, Whitney's in San Francisco in our hometown. Hey, Whitney. All right, so while Evan's making us a cocktail, you want to just tell them which ones you're mixing with which here so if people yeah. have the same ones at home? So we did it both ways and um, Kind of decided that we uh, liked the barrel rested gin uh, with the rhubarb vanilla syrup. Um, yeah, that really, makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> super tasty. The vanilla kind of helps draw out some of the oak flavors in the gin. Um, this one's a little bit sweeter than the lemon herb, and the barrel rested gin is also a little higher proof, mm -hmm. so a little bit more balance. Balance them out. Um, and then the brightness of the you know the botanicals in the Ivy City gin with you know, the fresh herbs that's in the lemon, um, the lemon herb really seem to go well together. Let's help it down a little more. So you You're so good at this. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm so glad we're around the right call. Let's have a soda water. Yeah. yeah, he's my home mixologist for sure. That is spot on pairing for our syrups. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've stumbled my way uh, around a few bars and been on the other side of the wood pouring people uh, in, my, in my days. So these seem like a, it was kind of a no-brainer. I was like, I guess we should try it the other way too, but it's going to work this way best. Yeah. <laughs> it's always fun to experiment, just, just in case. Because yeah. who knows? Sometimes never know. If you, if you always keep it safe, you never find the truly exciting things. For sure. That but is true. Plenty exciting 
even being, you know, the clear choice. All right, so while Evan is finishing up our cocktails here, I like to put him to work. Um, we're going to get started because it's uh, about five after six, so I feel like we gave everyone some time to get settled. We have about 25 people here right now, which is super exciting, um, and I'm sure some more people will be filtering in. So welcome, everyone. If Hi, guys. If this is your first time joining one of our virtual tasting experiences, we're super excited you're here. Um, we know that we have a few repeat people here that we recognize some of your beautiful faces as well. So thanks for joining us again. Um, so tonight we're super excited to feature gin, both a kind of straight gin and also a barrel rested gin. Um, and I love barrel rested gin, so I'm excited mm -hmm. to talk about that. Um, and also some garden to glass syrups um, from Simple Goodness Sisters. Beautiful artisanal kind of cocktail mixers, although they don't have to be used to make a cocktail. I'm nope. sure they'd be great in, you know, making pastries or just a, you know, a non-alcoholic yeah, tonic totally. on, a, on a hot day. Yeah, I think they also say like on ice cream, things like yeah, that. Yeah, oh yeah. So lots, of, lots of uses for these. Wonderful. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna kick off and um, as you're joining, we have a poll that we threw up. So if you could take the poll, we'd love to just get some feedback on what you're sipping on and what your current perception of kind of gin and at-home cocktail mixers, cocktail syrups are. We like to know where we're starting from. And right. if you're someone who, loves gin already, or if you're someone who's a little on the fence about gin, and the same with kind of at-home cocktail mixers as well. Um, and before we get too far into it, let's uh, give a little cheers, because I just made a couple cocktails. Yeah, cheers, everyone. Hold them up to the cheers. camera so you can see what you're drinking. It's a nice, yeah. Cheers, everyone, from afar. Well, I almost just did finishing my mine. Delicious. I almost took a sip. I almost didn't take a sip after cheersing and put my glass down. And I always give Suzanne a hard time about doing that. Because I'm a talker. And, and I so I, did it tonight. I cheers and then I keep talking instead of cheersing <laughs> and taking a sip. Um, all right. So let's get started. We're going to do a quick little overview um, just to make sure you guys are all oriented and you know who we are and you know what we're going to be doing tonight. And then we're going to kind of hand it over to our makers to tell you a little bit about their story, show you some visuals from them, all that good stuff. Um, so first, I guess... I'm Suzanne. I'm Hi. the finder, founder of the Crafty Cask. I'm Evan, um, and I'm a certified sommelier and hope to be soon certified pommelier. Results pending still, but uh, yeah. And, and he's also a bespoke wine tour guide um, in his, you know, for his day job when this crazy is going ago. on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, and the Crafty Cask, for those of you who this is your first experience with us, um, the Crafty Cask is all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers. And so we do that through putting on Meet the Maker events, now virtually as well. Um, and also we do a lot of written content, video content to help educate people about craft alcohol and hopefully get you guys to go to bars, restaurants, retailers, and look for craft. When you um, can. And ask for local <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff so we can support the small guys who are following their passions and following their dreams and really bringing us some delicious delicious tipples along the way. And in the meantime, while you can't go purchase them out there in the real world, um, we're trying to continue exposing and supporting them by doing these virtual tasting experiences. So, so thank you so much for being here and showing your support with your purchases and uh, by your attendance and by telling people about us and uh, and by telling people about Simple Goodness Sisters and 1-8 Distilling. Distilling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're just going to go over a few tech helpful tips for those of you who are a little bit newer to Zoom and especially to these kind of bigger Zoom meetings where there's lots of things going on. Um, so the best experience is likely from the computer. You can totally do this from your phone, but if you're having some issues and things are feeling glitchy, um, the computer does give you a little bit of a better experience. Um, gallery view is our recommended way to go. So in the top right of your screen there, you'll see like a little nine grid box. And if you hit that, you'll get a lot more beautiful faces on your screen. So you're not just staring at us the whole time or whoever's speaking. Um, and that's kind of fun because it makes it feel like more of a party. And so then when we do more cheers in the future, you get to kind of cheers multiple people at once. Um, and then I think Evan's gonna throw up that we have a little visual that's kind of helpful sometimes. Um, and then you can also at the bottom, you have the participants and that lets you see everyone who's attending. So you can see everyone's names. And if you have friends here and stuff, you can also chat them directly. Um, and so that's the gallery view, like we were talking about, that makes it a little more fun. Um, participants and chat is down below. Chat is super fun. We highly encourage you to use chat to talk to each other. You can chat each other one-on-one -on -one if you know people who are here, um, or chat to the whole group and kind of ask your questions and comments and things like that. 
Um, and so if you haven't already, throw in the chat where you're joining us from and um, what you're sipping on. We'd love to see that. We will do our best to keep an eye on the chat, but the best way to get our attention is to use the hand raise button. And um, that is down under participants as well, I believe. And so that's a great thing because I'll put a little blue hand next to your name and it will tell us, hey, stop talking, Suzanne. I want to cut in and I have something to say. And so then I'll stop talking and I'll let you cut in. Um, Maybe. Maria, Maria, you had uh, mentioned that you, you were curious if we could make the screen front and center bigger. Was that when I was doing the screen overlay? I do not know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is there, are you having a hard time seeing us? Well, you're the same size as everybody else, so what oh. you have displayed on your um, in front of you so, is really small. So yeah, if you if you go up in the top right hand corner, that was kind of what we just covered, and click okay. on speaker view, then yeah. you'll just get the speaker. Oh, That'll switch it back to the yeah. way it yeah, was so you when can, you started. You can toggle, and also there'll be a few times throughout tonight when we are highlighting people. So when our makers are talking, we'll highlight them, so it kind of forces everyone into speaker view for a minute but you can totally choose to go back to gallery view at any time you want. So if you want to still see other people's faces, you can just toggle right back, back out of that. Um, it just kind of helps you find who's talking when there's a lot of us on here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so use the hand raise function because honestly, we would rather you kind of let us know you want to say something. And Suzanne, you're muted. How did that happen? How the heck did that happen? Did you mute me? Maybe. <laughs> How um, yeah, so, so yeah, so. That was me. <laughs> I think you did it again. Oh no, okay. Um, I think when you hit mute all, it mutes it me too. as well. Yeah. So yeah, so that's kind of the gist of it. So if you don't want to talk though, and if you do want us to ask the question for you, feel free to throw your question in the chat and we'll certainly do that. But we would love for it, us to get to know you a little bit, hear your voice, hear your questions, get to engage back and forth um, and all that fun stuff. We'll also be sharing some links in the yes. chat, um, but we will also send an email out tomorrow morning with all the links. So if you get super jealous of what we're sipping on tonight after hearing all about them, which I think you will, mm -hmm. and you wanna go grab a bottle, we'll send out all those links tomorrow so that you can go support these great craft makers and get some bottles. Yeah. Um, How's well? Just a fun, uh, a fun evening here together, we hope, and uh, a couple of ways that we try to strive to keep it fun uh, is just with some house rules. So please en engage and interact and comment and ask questions. Uh, we don't want this to feel like a lecture. Uh, we really do encourage you to unmute yourself and say something if there's something on your mind. Don't worry about trying to type it out. Um, at the same time, um, you know, healthy debate is fun, fine and dandy, um, but we want this to be a civil, pleasant, uh, welcoming, encouraging, kind environment. So be courteous, um, no tolerance for hate speech, bullying, degrading comments, things like that, of course. You know, the um, standard policies of society that we should all be obliged by. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing that uh, is helpful is, you know, the uh, in the, uh, the chat, or I'm sorry, in the participants there, you can see where you can raise your hand, and that's another simple way to kind of get our attention. Um, oh, she said that, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then we have you all muted right now, um, and pl please don't take that as we don't want you to talk. It's really just everyone has background noise going on. There's dogs barking, there's babies crying, there's things going on. We have loud neighbors upstairs sometimes. Um, so it's really just to kind of keep the background noise down so you can hear what everyone's saying. Um, but you can unmute yourself, you can talk to us, we're happy to do all of that. All right, now let's, let's talk a little bit about gin and let's talk in. a little bit about cocktail mixers. Yeah. Um, so I'll start a little bit with my story. So I actually used to think that I hated gin. So for a very long time, I was definitely like in college, I probably had like tangere and tonic and was just like, this tastes like Christmas trees. This is gross. I don't know what's happening. And so I avoided gin like the plague for a very long time. Um, and then I realized I didn't actually hate gin. I hated crappy tonic. And so if like, and so it's an interesting thing. And even to this day, if I go out and I order a gin and tonic, I'm very wary. I always ask what kind of tonic it is because it really can make or break and kill a good gin, honestly. Yeah. So it's exciting to me tonight to have 
a gin feature, but also a mixers feature, because that was one of my earliest lessons when I was still like, I don't know, 22 or 23, that made me realize the importance of all of the ingredients in a cocktail, not just the spirit and how much it can really change things. Um, and so I similarly have, um, I've had a fair share of like home cocktail mixers and home kind of syrups and things. And a lot of times they're really artificial tasting. Chemically they're delicious. super sticky sweet. They're, you know, and so I've had a hard time with those as well. And so I was also very excited to find like a really kind of healthy, yeah. natural, really simple ingredients. I mean, you can read every ingredient on the label and you're like, I know what all that's those all things are. Is. Um, to, to kind of play around with. So that's yeah. super fun too. So that's kind of my excitement um, about tonight. And I agree. Food. And, you know, I, I often find that the, to your point, they're too sweet. And you know these are sweet; they have sugar in them, That's but sweet. Right. it's not it's not uh, artificial sweeteners, which to me like NutraSweet just tastes so unmanageable to my to my palate. Uh, I cannot stand that. Belinda's soda. giving us a big thumbs down. Yeah, uh, and this is very clearly you know genuine ingredients and made with care and uh, and thought about what you're putting in your body and putting chemicals in your body excessively. This seems to be, I don't know, not what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just looking at the poll here right now. So I'll um, end this and share. If you haven't taken the poll, take the poll real quick because I'd love to see where you stand on gin and home cocktail mixers. Um, but it's looking like we have lots of gin lovers here, which isn't surprising. And then, but we also have, you know, four, eight people who aren't sure and kind of like it. And similarly with cocktail mixers. So I'm excited to yeah. kind of see if we change some perceptions tonight and change some minds because that's honestly, one of the most fun parts of our job. Um, but, you know, the thing with gin, and we're going to start off with 1-8 distilling and have Alex kind of talk to us a little bit about their gins in particular. Oh, are you swapping with me? Yeah, I want to try Thanks. that one now. Thanks. Um, is, you know, I think there's been a really, there, there's a very long history. We have, we've written a few articles, but written a few articles about this on the Crafty Cast. There's a really long history of gin. And for a long time, especially around prohibition, there was like bathtub gin that was not good, right? It was not being made with care. It was not being made well. It was kind of whatever you could throw in there. And it got a really bad rap in the U.S. for a long time. Um, and it really, and it also got a really bad rap that it's this super juniper heavy bomb that like every gin out there tastes like a Christmas tree. And while a hundred percent, like the, the technical definition of gin is that it does have to have predominantly juniper as the botanical, so by recipe definition, that's true. The way it's just like cooking. You can have a ton of one spice in a, in a recipe, but all the other spices, the way they play with it, kind of play that down a little bit, even though by volume, it might be the highest volume spice right. in the recipe. If you're, a, if you're a chef, I mean, throw three or four sprigs of saffron in whatever you're cooking, you're definitely going to recognize that. So even though there might be three tablespoons of something else in there, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a myth that is one of my favorite myths to bust. So whenever I meet someone who says, I don't like gin, it tastes like Christmas trees. I'm like, you haven't tried gins lately because I think craft distillers in particular are really playing with the whole spectrum of gin and they're really playing with the boundaries of what does that mean yeah. to be a gin and still be juniper predominant but have other beautiful flavors and be more mellow on the juniper, more strong on the juniper, all those types of things. So we're really excited for that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's raise a little glass to Alex and Belinda and Venice for being here. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you spending your night with us and teaching us all about these delicious things. Um, and with that, I'd love to throw it over to Alex, but if anyone wants to, like, we want, can take a minute. If anyone has any comments, any thoughts, wants to chime in on anything we've said so far, we can take a minute to do that as well. Um, anyone? 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 All right, Alex, I'm going to throw it over to you. We'll unmute you here. So, Alex, I would love to hear your story and, um, oops. I think I'm trying to unmute you at the same time you're unmuting yourself. Oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> so we'd love to start off with kind of your story and sure. what your role in all this is and how this got started and what 1-8 Distilling is all about. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, well, thanks so much for tonight. This is a, this is a lovely joy. And uh, 
uh, hey to my former home uh, in San Francisco. I lived there uh, for 11 years and cool. uh, I really developed my palate uh, living in, in San Francisco and uh, being exposed to some of the earliest craft distilleries at, um, you know, at, at uh, uh, you know, in the city and, and across the bay. Um, uh, so yeah, my story, I, I uh, met my partner in the business, Sandy Wood, as an undergrad on the East Coast. Uh, then after college, moved to San Francisco. I worked in biotech labs, managed labs, uh, mostly in the South San Francisco area. Um, but at the same time, I was really engaged in wine country, in craft beer. Uh, I really loved uh, all the restaurants and the cuisine in San Francisco. I loved shopping at the farmer's markets yeah, uh, sure. and, and cooking every week. And, uh, you know, that, that really uh, just engaged my palate. You know, as far as my background with gin, I was definitely of a London dry gin uh, mindset. I loved a dry martini. Uh, that was the only way you could drink a martini because so many bars didn't actually treat their vermouth well and keep it in their uh, that's true. So, you know, that's uh, one of Evan's pet peeves. Well, let's let's do a little PSA for that for a minute because that's one of Evan's pet peeves because vermouth right. vermouth also gets a bad rap, yeah. but a lot of times sherry it's because, as well. Sure. But um, yeah. so for those of you who don't know, so anything that's wine based, so vermouth, sherry, things of that nature, you kind of like they last longer than wine because yeah. they are fortified, but like you have to treat them like wine. So really, they should be kept in your fridge. Yeah. So if you have a bottle of vermouth that's been sitting in your bar and has been under there for a few months get rid of it, get a new one, start over and keep it in your fridge and it will- Especially like, for fortified wine-based uh, products that are not sweet. So sherries and vermouths, especially, you know, port, you can kind of, you can kind of skirt the boundaries on that. But yes, also very important for cocktails. Yes. Back to you, Alex. We're done oh, with our PSA. Well, thank you. you know, I, <laughs> it's something I, I, uh, I, I talk about as well a lot. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, the, you know, the West Coast, the, the amount of ingredients that are available year round uh, are, is just astounding. And the idea of just uh, cooking with those ingredients, bringing them to the plate and letting them shine through is really a lot of the ideas that I bring to distilling. So, uh, you know, working with local farms to source our grains, working with great providers of botanicals for our gin in, in particular, uh, is just is just key and just letting those flavors come through uh, so you know after a career in biotech and moves to first to New York and then now to DC um, I uh, my, my friend Sandy approached me with this idea of opening the distillery together and that was back in 2013 it took us a couple of years to get it off the ground um, but uh, we've been cranking away ever since well except for this uh, latest little pause in our production. Sure. Although yeah. I, I will show you briefly my, my latest uh, product here. I don't know oh, if you can yeah. see it very well. Hand sanitizer. Cool. You know, nice. Yes, we're doing our part. Uh, Thanks trying for to doing do our that, part. that's great. I know a lot yeah. of distillers are trying to jump into that and provide something for the community during this time of need, that's great. And just to kind of uh, help you with your promo, for those of you who are in the DC area, I believe that if you purchase something online to be picked up at the distillery, there's a promotional bottle of hand sanitizer included while supplies last. Yeah, supplies didn't last long. Oh, it didn't last very long. <laughs> but we do have a little bit left for sale. But okay. Yeah, no, it's amazing oh. how fast the hand sanitizers are going everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. But for the most part, we really have been cranking. We we uh, did upsize the equipment in our distillery uh, about a year ago, so we're really making a lot of spirit. Uh, we do have a full range of spirits and the district made line. So you, you have the, uh, the gin and the, the barrel gin. We also have a vodka and a rye and a bourbon. Um, and then we released our first bottled and bond rye as well this year. It's a really exciting range of products. Oh, there's the front door right there. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun warehouse space in the Ivy City neighborhood. Um, hmm, we're looking at some, some wheat there, it looks like. Uh, those are our stills, uh, Italian-made barrels. Talk about your stills, because are, are these yeah. ice stills? Is that right? So this one is a Barrison still. Yeah. Uh, so what we do for to make our gin, we we aren't aren't starting with neutral grain spirit. A lot of distilleries working making gin and vodka will start with a neutral grain spirit. We're starting with the grain ourselves, and then we can distill it, 
on our uh, continuous column still and then redistill it on what you see right here. We call her Pearl. Uh, that's our, um, there she is. <laughs> yeah, so our, our hybrid pot still. So we have okay. two columns, 30 trays total. We can hit 192 proof, uh, making a fairly neutral spirit ourselves. Uh, and then that spirit is then in, in the case of making our gin, I mean, at that point, it's really our vodka that can be proofed down, but we're going to then redistill it on the ice still, which is a small wow. still from the Netherlands. Um, we can, we like having the smaller still. I have, I have other print. pictures of stills here. Let's see if yeah. we can get to it. So those are both the, the stills. The column is on the left and the, uh, the column we call Connie. And that's Pearl again in the front there. Uh -huh. I, I love that them. they're named. Of course, we have to name them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're beautiful stills. I uh, love working with these folks from Italy. Um, See some of our barrels. So we are using, in the case of the barrel rested gin, both new oak as well as ex bourbon barrels. So our own bourbon has spent some time in a barrel and then we will fill it with the gin. Um, there we go, a little bit of our rye. We used to have the whiskeys named Rock Creek. Mm. The name has changed mm -hmm. uh, to district made for everything. That's our old still in the back corner. So that's a Kota hybrid pot still in the front, but in the back, corner there, that little black still. That's, oh, that's the ice still. That's so right, I guess we yeah. have a great photo for you. But um, yeah, so it's a very small still. It's a 250 liter versus this this Kota and the same as our new pot still is a 2000 liter. So when we're distilling the gin, we'll actually run that little still about 15 times for every run of vodka that comes off the pot. Uh, but having the small pot size really allows us to control how we're introducing the botanical flavors into the spirit. So um, again, you can sort of see the eye still in the back mm -hmm. corner there. That's, a, that's a years ago, that, that picture, but. <laughs> and the idea, with, the, the idea with eye stills is that they're a little bit more like modern and automated a little bit. Is that right? Like they're, they're measuring the temperature and they're doing all like more things than traditional stills do? Absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's a far more automated system than our regular pot still. Uh, and, you know, we can really, uh, in the case of distilling a raw spirit, you can really dial it in and it's almost plug and play. Uh, they actually mark it in the countries where it is legal to distill at home, they mark it a smaller version to the home distiller. Ah, uh, but, I see. but some craft distillers actually will buy, you know, 10 of these and they have larger versions and have a whole farm of them. It's, a, it's a, an affordable still. Uh, oh. But in our case, it's great for us to do it. Oh, there's our tasting room there. Beautiful. Um, oh, very nice. Very fun. Yeah, it's a fun place to hang out. I wish we could have some some guests there, you know, today, but uh, soon enough. Sure. Soon Everyone enough. envision yourself there right now. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, the ice still allows, again, that control of just bringing in the, the botanical flavors. So we'll hang uh, ground botanicals in baskets under the column, the base of the column. Mm -hmm. uh, view from our bar there, you can see see two to our stills there that's really cool i love when tasting rooms have a view of the actual like distilling area as well yeah it's it's great to be grounded you know have the views from the bar and uh you know see that we're actually producing it yeah mm -hmm. um yeah so um, oh and here's our range this is of your full kind of lineup. yeah the a little step back so our base spirits that we uh use to make the vodka and gins are is a uh, mostly rye base so we're using um, rye grown in Virginia, out oh. of pepper, and a bit of corn in the mash. The corn's grown on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, Land's End Farm, all organic. And then we get some rye malt from a malt house down in Asheville, North Carolina, called Riverbend. And again, it's all about making those uh, base grains shine through in the spirit. When it came time to de designing our gin, uh, we chose botanicals that first were Classic in the London dry sense, of course, the juniper, uh, coriander, um, grains of paradise for some pe pe peppery heat, uh, licorice root, orris root, angelica root, lemon peel, uh, all very classic um, gin ingredients. But we were finding the blend of those that would balance the base character of the spirit, uh, as opposed to a, a gin that's starting with a completely neutral spirit where you can't taste anything of what it was made from. So that was really important to us. It took us months. We, we began, we opened the distillery in January. We hoped we'd have the gin in February or March. Uh, we didn't have it until uh, almost July. Uh, 
but um, it was blend after blend after blend uh, determining how we how we, how we liked it. So, so um, Alex, could you go uh, and uh, go ahead and maybe walk us through the the Ivy City gin and briefly yeah. just to start with. Um, I'm sure Ivy City has something to do with DC, but I'd love to know why that's the name. Sure, sure. Uh, so the smallest neighborhood in DC is Ivy City, and that is where the distillery is located. Okay. Uh, tiny little neighborhood on the way out of town, going going uh, east on New York Avenue, um, which is Route 50. So we would, you could get on Route 50 and go all the way out to uh, San Francisco, pretty much. Wow. Uh, okay. uh, but yeah, so. Uh, uh, that is that is our neighborhood, and that's why we named the gin Ivy City Gin. Very good. Um, so yeah, it's uh, uh, very much spice forward, and our signature botanical, in, in addition to the ones I talked about earlier, is uh, grown all over the eastern U.S. It's known as Appalachian Allspice. Some people also call it American Spice Bush, hmm. uh, and it uh, we get ours from Ohio, but it does grow native all over. Uh, it was used by Native Americans, and then the early uh, col you know, colonists came over and learned to use it. They couldn't get the allspice that they knew from Europe, so they were they were used it. Uh, we love it so much. We we have more of it in there than anything except for juniper, of course. Uh, hey, um, I think Belinda has a question here. Belinda, want to unmute yourself and ask? Hey, so you basically Hello. answered it, um, but I was wondering at the start of when you were talking about, I mean, I'm sure I could infer all kinds of quality and taste differences, but why you guys decided at the beginning that you didn't want to use a neutral green spirit, you wanted to do your own. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So um, craft, uh, craft means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, and I'm not going to pass any judgments. When it comes to a gin, a lot of the, um, the character comes from your botanical blend and how you're preparing it. Um, but for us, it was more important to take a step back and start from the grain itself, uh, from the farm. Uh, we were, when we were beginning, we interned at a great distillery in West Virginia called Smooth Ambler. And John's the head distiller there. And uh, he was amazing and been a great resource at the time. Now they're only a whiskey distiller, but at the time they made a gin, they made a barrel rested gin, vodka, everything. And I asked on my way out the door, you know, any last advice? And he said, don't make vodka, don't make gins, buy neutral grain spirit. No one cares. And I'm like, but John, you make it from grain, you know? And that's the thing. It's just, you can't put a finger on it. You know, why do it? It's cheaper to buy neutral grain spirit. That's for sure. He didn't uh, want competition right. because he knew how much better it was. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's, it's a way for us to put a stamp on it. You know, no one else is going to make a gin like this because they're not using the same grains that we're using to make the base and the same stills. Uh, whereas so many others are starting with the exact same neutral grain. So, so I'm throwing up an article right now that we um, wrote. It's funny, every spirits uh, event we've had, this topic has kind of come up. Um, so we wrote an article a while back called How Craft is the Bottle You're Drinking, and it's basically talking to what Alex is referring to right now, which is that there's really like a whole spectrum of craft. There is one end of it that's like, okay, that's definitely not craft. And then there's the other end of it that's like, that's like the craftiest, crafty, crafty way you can do it. And it's a lot of energy and a lot of time. And then there are some kind of hybrids in between. And so we wrote an article that kind of really covers that spectrum. It also helps you figure out how can I tell? How can I tell when I'm looking at a bottle? Like, is this just someone who is buying neutral grain spirit that someone else distilled and they're just kind of adding their botanicals in? Or is it someone who's really starting from the grain and starting all the way? And, you know, depending on what your values are and how much you care about these things, like it's important to be able to start to suss that out when you're buying, when you're buying bottles yourself. Um, Alex, just before we get into the barrel rested gin, I just wanted to ask you, because one of the things that struck me the most about the Ivy City gin um, is the texture and the mouthfeel. And it's just incredibly pleasant to have something that has so much rich botanicals also kind of sit and not be like, the alcohol doesn't kind of brace your mouth too much. And I think it's because of the texture. Uh, and is that something that you more attribute to the distilling process itself or 
you, the grain that you're using, in, 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 you know, in, in your case, uh, the fact that you're using rye. Yeah. So um, uh, some of the texture is definitely from, you know, the base spirit. Um, you know, we, we can uh, still come off the still at a very high proof on the base. Excuse me. Uh, but continue to go into the tails a little bit where you do get some of the fusel oils coming through, which does give it some texture. Sure. But then the next step uh, in our process, which I didn't cover all the details, and I'm just going to close my email really quick so it doesn't keep beeping at us. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so the next step is actually we, uh, we do filter. Um, at this point, it's, it's our vodka that we would then redistill to make the gin. We filter it with a uh, filter we purchased from uh, Russia. It's called the Techno Filter. Uh, and what it, had, it does, it's a um, basically activated charcoal filter, nothing unusual that way. Uh, but it also adds platinum ions into the, the charcoal. Wow. Platinum is a catalyst for a reaction that converts some of the alcohol into an aldehyde. Again, giving our spirit a nice mouthfeel. Polishing the vodka is another way of talking about it. It uh, really is. It's interesting. So Evan knows that I've, I've turned the corner on gin and I like gin a lot now, but I'm not one to drink gin straight. Like it just isn't like, so even when he tells me like, take a sip and I just told everyone else to do the same thing. So I'm telling all of you to do something that I typically am a little wary of myself, but this gin is like one of the first gins I've, I've found that I could drink that straight. Like it's yeah. so smooth and that thicker kind of viscosity of the mouthfeel yeah. and it's not I don't get a ton of juniper in it at all actually it's very kind of evenly balanced on the juniper and all the other elements and it's yeah. really quite yeah. quite lovely it's a really nice nice gin and to the point you were making earlier about you'll know if there's a few strands of saffron in your dish even though there's ounces of something else there's eight pounds of juniper in a batch and for example there might be 60 grams of lemon peel. Although you smell it, you get that lemon on the nose right away, yeah. of course. Uh, and there's plenty of other things in there. But, um, you know, the, the, there is so much juniper, but it just doesn't come through the way we redistill it yeah. uh, as, as so heavy. Yeah, um, so yeah when someone who feels like gin tastes like Christmas trees and I don't like that, this is a great gin to try because it's definitely. not, it's on the different end of the spectrum for sure. Yeah, it was reviewed uh, by the Washington Post when we first released it. And uh, Fritz Hahn writes for food and entertainment. And, and uh, he described it as his new sipping gin. And at the time, I had really never considered sipping on a gin. But yeah. it really works. Changing hearts and souls there. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about um, barrel rested gin and the kind of the flavor profiles here? And especially, I feel like Barrel rested gin um, is kind of a newer hot trend. Fun I mean, trend. it's been going on for a very long time, of course, but we haven't seen it much in the United States until recently. Um, and so I'd love to hear just a little bit of your thoughts about that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a whiskey lover's gin. Uh, you get some of the, the oak qualities that whiskey lovers tend to like uh, in a gin. Um, for us, the key was to balance our gin flavors to maintain the qualities that we liked so much in the Ivy City gin uh, with the oak. So uh, we actually began um, before the district made Ivy City gin uh, by doing, we also have a series of spirits we call the untitled spirits. So we have several untitled whiskeys, a few untitled gins. Uh, we just number them, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, the first untitled gin, number one, uh, was uh, a different recipe, most of the same botanicals, just at different proportions, uh, rested in an ex-bourbon barrel. Uh, we liked it, but we wanted more oak character. So untitled gin number two, uh, which became what we're drinking tonight, uh, was aged, partial, part of it was aged in new oak and then part in ex-bourbon, then blended together after six months. So it's not a lot of age. Um, the, uh, uh, and that's why we call it a barrel rested, um, as opposed to aging whiskey for years. Right. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we, we love the balance of flavors. We love increasing, for example, the fennel that's in our gin, uh, more juniper, 
Um, there's more also of the grains of paradise. Um, and those flavors still remain, I think, you know, forefront with the addition of the character from the, the barrels. So what's nice about it is we're, we are using the two different barrels. So we're getting some of the bourbon qualities from the ex-bourbon yes, barrels do. and uh, more of the oak that we're extracting from the new oak barrels. So you're getting yeah. um, some vanillins. Uh, we're getting some, um, you know, definitely some tannin. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, and then, um, yeah, some, some caramelized wood sugars from the charring in the barrel. Some really lovely qualities, I think. Uh, we liked this gin uh, at, at this proof. You know, the funny story about the Ivy City gin, which I didn't mention, real inside dirt here from 1.8. Our first bottle was screen printed. It was a different bottle. It was screen printed with the proof at 80. So when we came up with our gin, it had to be 80 because that's what the bottle said. Um, <laughs> and then when we were finishing that first batch of bottles, we thought, okay, let's play around with the proof. It actually didn't taste the same at a higher proof. It fell apart. So that's why Ivy City Gin is at 80. When we came time for the untitled gin number two, which is now our, our barrel rest gin, we could taste it at every proof coming out of the barrel. Uh, we just added more water and we settled on 102. So it's a lot heftier than, uh, than our regular Ivy City Gin. So. Cool. I think it's it's a lovely sipper on its own as well, uh, but really fun in cocktails. Alex, have you ever um, thought about experimenting with uh, reducing the proof with uh, tails from previous distillations? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting style. I've definitely tried it some. Um, you know, commonly uh, a lot of distilleries will uh, redistill tails to make a gin because, so the tails, are, uh, if you're not familiar, what comes towards the end of the run. You be, a pot still run will start with the heads. Hearts are generally what we'll keep for a vodka and then tails. We'll go deeper into the tails in a whiskey run. Uh, but some people will save all those tails and redistill them. And you can make gin with that because you're generally using so much botanical flavors that some of the less pleasant qualities of the tails will be overpowered. Um, but for us, we, uh, we don't do that. We're just proofing down with water, uh, you know, uh, reverse osmosis filtered water. But, okay. um, but so we yeah. had a question about water, Alex. Um, Laura was asking how important is the water you use and where does your water come from? Like how important sure. is that as an ingredient? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's Potomac water, uh, Potomac River water. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not the, um, the, the cleanest water in the world. San Francisco had much better water. New York has much better water, of course. Kentucky, we'll talk about their limestone aquifers for their <laughs> all day. Um, so yes, we do purify the water with a reverse osmosis. Any of the water that we're adding to the barrel or to the bottle, we're proofed down. Uh, any water that's going to be going into our mash uh, would be boiled first. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I would love for some of you to let us know what your, um, so I, I was challenging people before while you were talking, Alex, to mm. sip their gin straight if they were drinking it in a cocktail currently and just to try it straight. And we were, we were doing a little learning as we were going because a lot of people, not surprisingly, when they take their first sip, it's like, ah, that's like fire. It's a lot, you know? And right. so talking about don't ever trust your first sip, you know, take a second sip, take a third sip to acclimate a little bit. And people are now getting, so I'd love to just hear like, what are you guys tasting in the gins you're drinking? Um, any questions for Alex? Any thoughts? Anything we want to talk about about gin? Don't be shy. All right. Corbin, I feel like you're going to say something. I see you leaning in there. You're drinking now blue coat. I like that stuff. I like blue coat too. Aaron is a great distiller. He's, yeah. Now he's he down here in Philly, yeah? Yes, yeah. Oh, I don't know that other one. What do you got there? Gunpowder, yeah. Oh, gunpowder, yeah. Irish. gunpowder Irish gin. Yeah. Oh, drum shambo. Yeah, that's good. I like that too. I don't think I've had that one. When I tasted it just on its own, it tastes very licorice -y. And oh. she, she didn't like that one before. I didn't used to like it, hers. but I think now more that I'm trying it, I like it more. Yeah. I think anise, Alex, anise is a relatively common botanical that can be used in, or fennel, right? In, yeah, in we use fennel. That licorice flavor. 
Mm -hmm. We yeah. use fennel seed and uh, and licorice root as well. Um, oh yeah, oh they show you what they use in theirs. Yeah, that's cool. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, the licorice root I feel adds a nice uh, earthiness. Um, we use so little of it; it's very very potent. I ask a question. Oh yeah, go for it. Or, or make a comment. So mm -hmm. Alex, um, with the barrel rested, um, we've been using it more in kind of rye and whiskey based cocktail. So like in Manhattans, do you find that people do that? Is that a good use of the barrel rested gin? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. I mean, an old fashioned with our gin, or with the, the barrel rested gin is great. Um, really, you know, the martini had its origin in the Martinez, which is more like a Manhattan cocktail. So it has a sweet vermouth instead of the dry vermouth. Uh, and that's very, very appropriate for the barrel rested gin. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, I always cool. joke that um, barrel rested gin and barrel aged gins, I like to use as a way to trick my friends who say they hate gin, but they love whiskey. And I like to just make them a cocktail with a barrel rested gin or a barrel aged gin, and I'll make them an old fashioned or Manhattan, and then they'll love it. And I'm like, guess what? That's <laughs> gin. You know, it, it's a really nice way to actually ease people into gin, especially if they're whiskey drinkers. Um, so I love, I love whiskey drinks with barrel lesser gin. Suzanne and I are both big fans of Negronis and Boulevardiers. And so this is a perfect kind of like, I can't decide which one I want. Let's make both <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably my go-to cocktail with the barrel lesser gin is, is yeah. Negroni. Yeah, Laura's saying that the viscosity on the on your gin, she agrees, it's very rich. Mm -hmm. Like, and she's like, like, I love it. It's, yeah, it's fun. That's yeah, delicious. Hey, Belinda, did you have a question? I do. So um, I am definitely a drinker, but there are a lot of people who are not, or I think there's a lot of people in this in-between category. And it, um, background, I'm a mom of two young kids. So when I drink, one drink makes me basically like, that's all I can have, you know, if I'm going to function and be a mom. So there's a lot of people going for this in-between space of low ABV, and you see that a ton right now in Europe with gins that are lower proof. Have you guys thought about that? I would love to see this trend come to the U.S. So literally every gin maker I ask, I ask this question. So, Well, you know, happy accident, as I was talking about earlier, that, you know, the gin is at 80. Um, so that is the lowest proof that we can release any spirits. That's the law. Uh, you can't go below 80. Um, in a liqueur, you can, but a spirit like vodka, gin, whiskey, etc., 80 is the minimum. Uh, and that's where it's going to stay. We're very happy with it there. Um, hey, Belinda, there is um, there's a gin liqueur down in LA. They're called Pomp and Whimsy. And they basically started that brand because of this trend and seeing it be so popular in Europe. And so they, they created a gin liqueur that you know, has the flavors and botanicals of gin, but because it's a liqueur, is allowed to classified lower. as a liqueur. And so uh, that's kind necessity. of a they'd be a fun one to keep an eye on and see like if other people are starting to do that too, because I feel like they're one of the earlier ones kind of Sip jumping in on that. spirits is the same thing as well, mm -hmm. I believe, right? No, she's a normal gin. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. There's something like that that has yeah. Not, yeah, maybe. it's so difficult with the classifications because I think the marketing becomes a really big challenge. Well, I think like, it's what, really what hard. Liqueur? Like I don't want a gin liqueur. You know, right. I don't know what that is. I don't want it. So yeah. I totally understand the the issue with why a, a maker might not consider making it. But I think that there's demand for the product and we just need to figure out what to call it. You yeah, know? <laughs> for sure. That's the hurdle for sure is marketing. the marketing side of it. Yeah. And, yeah. and honestly, the, the retail side of it too, because it's like, where does it go on shelf? Like, is it with the yeah. gin? Is it with the like liqueurs? Like what, with where do you look for it? Like, yeah. It gets I think that you see so many of these like, craft cocktail malt beverages that have come out um, filling this need and it would be really nice to see it be done in a in a much better way in a spirit driven craft way yeah yeah that's my cool. thanks yeah. a another way to approach that would be just in the cocktail itself um, you know yeah finding a great tonic or a tonic syrup that you're happy with you can bring down the ABV yeah um, you know, a martini these days, if you have a really nice vermouth yeah. that you can, you know, that pairs with your gin, you know, instead of two to one gin to vermouth, go the other way around, one to two, and then it's much yeah. lower ABB. 
Yeah, as a syrup company, what we find is that the home consumer doesn't know how to make cocktails that they're going to love to enjoy. So we do a lot of work on education on recipes and how to actually make the cocktail because they love it when they have it in person and then they go home and try to recreate it and they struggle. And so I think that's where my concern is of like, if it was just bottled at a lower proof, they could just make an easy cocktail. Yeah, for sure. Hey, we mentioned tonic and I mentioned earlier how important I think good tonic is. And so I wanted to show um, not th this. So this is one brand, but there's a lot of brands out there, but there are actually now these like artisanal tonic syrups and artisanal tonic waters. Um, and the cool thing about these, and you know, this is something I, I think is similar is, so we have a soda stream at home and we, so you, you basically can have sparkling water at any time and then you can add tonic syrups to, you know, what, what that is. So you can make gin and tonics whenever you need to, but your tonic water isn't going flat and you're not worried about that. And so it is kind of fun to help you lower the ABV of what you're drinking. Um, and then also just like start to play around and experiment a little bit. So I would encourage you guys. Um, to keep your eye out for like the syrups we're going to talk about in a minute. Like there's just a lot of really cool stuff going on in this space with bitters, with syrups, with tonics, um, with all of the yeah. different mixers that are very different than what they used to be with the like lime green colored, you know, things in plastic bottles and, you know, you have no idea what's in there. It's, it's, it's really been transformed. Yeah, very much reflective of what we've seen, you know, across the alcohol side of the yeah. industry and you know the the restaurant world and you know to an extent even uh, sustainably sourced fabrics for clothing and all these great things uh it's really neat to see how that's getting into so many different industries people are you know aware of and um conscientious about what they're putting in their body what they're putting in their home and and where it's coming from and how it's being produced and it's it's a wonderful trend um, so I think that's a, a great little segue here yeah. to, to kick it over to the Simple Goodness Sisters. Uh, Venice, Belinda, who, uh, who'd like to take the reins here to start off with? That's always the great debate between sisters, isn't it? Us <laughs> too. I didn't want to pick for you, so. Um, well, I'll go because I'm on unmute and I don't know if Venice is yet. I, I am. That's okay, fine. cool. Um, I'm going to go back to the other view so I can see you too. Okay. Um, so we are a artisanal syrup company um, that is truly farm to bar. And that's different because in our knowledge of things as it is now, we are the only one in the United States doing this, who's actually taking something that they make from, you know, local sources and their own farm and creating a really delicious, high quality drink mixer that doesn't have any additives, dyes. Um, there's a lot of chemicals in a lot of our preserved um, or shelf stable products that are helpful and an inexpensive way to make a shelf stable product, such as citric acid. Um, and even those we don't use, even though they are technically classified as natural. So really we're trying to have a very pure ingredient list and a very um, fun and delicious sourcing strategy that highlights the farmers in our area. We have our syrups in a few different flavors, and all of those flavors are dictated by what we grow. So each of our syrups comes from uh, in the inspiration of the farm. And since Venice is the farmer, I'll let her take that from there. All right. Hey. So yeah, we have a small farm. We're here in Buckley, Washington, which is just on the foothills of Mount Rainier. So, um, and we grow herbs primarily, and then we grow a lot of herb, rhubarb. So in every single syrup flavor that we have, at least one thing comes from the farm. Um, and then the only, so it's basically sugar, organic sugar, sugar, water, and then there's usually a berry or a flavoring component, and then there's an herbal component um, or a spice component. So uh, you guys are drinking rhubarb vanilla beans, so we grow the rhubarb. Um, and then obviously we source the vanilla bean. Um, and then on in the lemon herb, we obviously don't grow lemons in Washington. <laughs> and so we source those. Um, and then, but in everything that we do, we try to make it so that we can source it back to the farm. So even if we're buying lemons, we know what farm they came from. Um, and then we grow all the herbs that go into the lemon herbs. So the lemon herb is one of my favorites because it has four different herbs and we grow all of the herbs that are 
in that set. So cool. um, it's, it's so funny. It's when very first... thyme, sage, and then a tiny bit of lavender, which you usually won't taste, but it is in there. Um, when we first tried it, Venice, it was funny. We, um, I think we just tried it straight at first just to try it out. We're like ticking off. Well, and he, he was like, rosemary. And I'm like, no, sage. And then we look at the bottom. We're like, oh, we're both right. <laughs> They're very yeah, it's like, really oh, fun. I, when we do tastings, I, I ask people, you know, what they can taste. And um, yeah, it's funny because a lot of different people have different things like jump out, of, out at them right away. So it's fun to kind of get people to guess. Um, but yeah, it's, we grow on our farm here in Buckley. We're only on 10 acres, so we're pretty small. We're just 45 minutes outside of um, Seattle-ish, depending on traffic. <laughs> right now, it's 45 <laughs> minutes because there's no one on the road. But <laughs> um, so we, farms in our area tend to be less than 20 acres. So we um, are small on the scale of farms, but um, pretty average for around here. And uh, we grow... Our, we like to say our farm is the only cocktail farm, although I'm not sure that's true. But according to Google, we're the only cocktail farm. All right. Well, all accounts in this day and <laughs> age. Google says it's true. <laughs> it's true. So we grow all herbs and edible flowers on our farm. And then um, we do grow, you know, I, I have a garden for myself. And so I do grow um, vegetables and things like that. And we experiment. We're starting to experiment with some different flavors. And so then I'll throw, like, last year I grew a whole lot of beets. Um, and so we experiment on the farm as well, but for the most part, we're growing all herbs and edible flowers um, with the idea that everything can be um, used in a cocktail. Go ahead, yeah. Bonnet. So the reason the whole thing got started is that I'm a cocktail caterer and I began my business without a liquor license, which meant when I would arrive at an event, I was wholly dependent on what my client provided. And it was usually not gin as good as Alex's. Like it was not <laughs> district eight gin. It was, you know, probably the lesser expensive, more available option. And so we thought, how do we create a mixer that's so delicious and tasty that it will taste good with whatever our client has and have that, um, you know, ability to improve our reputation event after event without having that factor of what the heck am I going to show up and, <laughs> and find. So our syrups, that's the reason they're all multiple note is that there's layers of flavor and they're all very um, exciting and unique flavors that also tend to highlight the Pacific Northwest. Um, so we have like a huckleberry spruce tip with the foraged huckleberries from the mountains here and the spruce tips that we harvest off the farm in a three week period in May. It's a very specific flavor. It's a <laughs> seasonal release, but um, all of those flavors were meant to be like, how do we make them as delicious as possible for these events and then what we found is that at those events people wanted to recreate the drink at home and when we would tell them the recipe their eyes kind of glazed over it was very clear no one was going to do this <laughs> and so Venice at our very first event was actually carrying ice for me because that's what you do is you call on your sister for help and she was like you need to bottle this I have like, really you... big strong muscles I can carry a lot of ice <laughs> <laughs> There were like three places that offered to sell the rhubarb vanilla locally at that first event. They were like, if you wow. bottle this, we'll sell it. Um, cool. Yeah, and, and rhubarb is actually really special to our area. We're the rhubarb pie capital of the world. Really? You didn't know that, and now you do. Um, <laughs> we are the county that our farm is in. So we're uh, in Buckley, which they say is just below the snow, but um, above the fog, because below us, is Sumner and um, but our county is Pierce County and we are the number one grower of fresh rhubarb in the nation. So um, we have a lot of rhubarb hot houses and fields and so rhubarb is pretty easy for us to get year round. Yeah, so people were really excited about that flavor in particular. And Venice just continued to bug me for the next year and a half until I was ready to choke down the prospect of starting a new business and decided to bottle the syrups. And the nice thing about having that catering company is we were able to basically test each flavor of syrups on, you know, 10,000 people a year that we were servicing through our events. And so the, the, best flavors kind of rose to the top and that's what we bottled and so I'm actually I went rogue today and I'm drinking our blueberry lavender syrup um, 
in a gin, lime, and club soda cocktail, which is one of my favorite combos. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'll add uh, like a white vermouth to it as well, and then mm. we call it the Seattle Sling. I'll up the lime juice, and I'll add that white vermouth, and it's got this really nice dry finish. Um, but that flavor was like the peak of 2018 events, and so it went into a bottle. And so that was a really nice way to test all the flavors. Um, by having this like multi-note kind of idea, it makes a really complete and easy to drink cocktail at home, mm -hmm. which is our whole goal for people so that everyone can be a home bartender without having to, you know, have a lot of recipes or look things up. I like um, to say that I'm our target market because I yes. am not a bartender. <laughs> I have to tell I'm her like, really, you have to shake that. <laughs> I'm really lazy. Yes. <laughs> and so like, I don't, yeah, I don't want to shake it. I don't want to like put, I only have like vodka gin whiskey in my liquor cabinet that's it like there's no vermouth there's no extra like special things I love it when Belinda makes me a cocktail like love it because I don't have to do anything and because she's way better at it than I am and so for me it's like if the if I can make a cocktail and make it taste good um that then we nailed it <laughs> yeah you know it's funny when we were first talking about putting this event on we were like starting to brainstorm these like complicated cocktails and like, what can we do with these four products? And then we just tried them together and we were like, I don't think it needs anything more than that. Like it's really just delicious, just the gin and just the syrup. And like that makes a oh, beautiful water, cocktail. Yeah. yeah. I think one night we added a little bit of bitters to one of them and yeah, soda water, right. but yeah, like it's, there, it's nice that they, they really can serve as like, I just need the booze to mix with this and I have a cocktail, <laughs> you know, and it's that. delicious. You know, it's yeah. funny. It reminds me of uh, the the time I was when I was in Italy, um, and you'd have these amazing, amazing dishes, absolutely stunning, and they would be like four, four ingredients, ingredients, yeah, maybe yeah. five. Yeah, and if you start with Good. four like really high quality, superior ingredients. Of course, it's going to taste good. You don't mm. have to doctor it with a bunch of other stuff. And I think that these two cocktails yeah. are a perfect example of that, for sure. Yeah, Martha Stewart calls that best in class. And that's one of our um, kind of guiding principles is like, we're going to source the best of everything. Yeah. And then we're sometimes the best thing that you put into something is actually what you leave out of it. And so by leaving out all those other things and figuring out um, how to bottle this in a way that is shelf stable without adding everything else, right? We're actually using a pure acidity to bottle our products. And so it's a fruit-based acidity. So our berries are often sourced from wine growers because they have a higher acid berry. Yeah. And that allows us to get in the correct pH to be shelf stable without adding anything else to it. So our ingredient list is literally sugar, fruit, sage, you know, like that's it. Um, and that's part of what makes it great. I have become a citric acid snob. I taste it in everything now and I can't stand it and I can pick it out immediately. And so most people are not me, but you can <laughs> tell that like it tastes different. And I think that's what's great about it. You know, also thing too, I just want to show up close for those of you who don't have it. And so at first, give me a minute to explain what I'm saying here. So when you look at this, I'm turning it the wrong way. You can kind of see like that it's real, that there's like particles of things like in solution and there's things moving around. And it's an interesting thing to me because I know some of the distillers actually struggle with this a little bit because people are expecting. So I'm thinking of there's a, a lemon vodka out there that uses full fresh lemons and really like churns them up and they don't filter it because they're like, we think you can still get those oils and the flavors and like it's better if you leave that all in there rather than filtering it out. But consumers nowadays are so used to seeing pristine, crystal clear things. And if they're not like that, they think there's something wrong with them. And in fact, it's more like, no, if you can see the stuff floating in there, that like kind of means it's like real. It's like there's actual real ingredients in there and we're not using chemicals to keep them all perfectly blended at the same particle size all the time and in solution perfectly because that's not the way nature works. And so I've actually come to be a person that like, I actually really look for things that look cloudier or like, you know, less perfect because I think that usually is an indicator that like they're standing behind the fact that they started with really good ingredients and they don't need to filter and find things to death to make it taste good, yeah. just to make it pretty, you know? And so I love that too, that these feel like 
I feel like I'm using real ingredients when I use this because I am. Yep. Even though it's coming out of a bottle and it's making my life a hell of a lot easier than having to like <laughs> heat up water and do all this myself, you know, which is great. Yeah. I think that's part of, um, Belinda and I talk a lot about this, about we don't come from a food science background at all. We um, both came from like HR functions mm -hmm. at corporations. Um, and so, and to like when we first started, we were like, oh my gosh, this is our biggest weakness. Like we just don't, you know, know all of the different things that we can add. And we're literally just taking something that we make at home and we're putting it in a bottle. What, are we doing something wrong, you know? And then it, and that ended up being like one of our biggest strengths is that I think if we had known more, we might have tried to, tried to add chemicals so that we could have all, all these different flavors. But at the end of the day, we just knew that we needed to hit a certain pH in order for it to be shelf stable. And so we created flavors that allow us to do that without adding any chemicals. Cause honestly, we don't know how to add chemicals. <laughs> Sometimes too, like, Sometimes that creation within restraints, for me, it like breeds creativity to have restraints versus here's the whole wide ocean of what you can do. So I think it's forced us to be more inventive. Um, Venice was saying like we grew beets this year and a really popular drink that we have on our menu at Happy Camper is, um, it's called the Heartbeat and it's a, a beet shrub and whiskey and lemon mm -hmm. cocktail that's really delicious um, and no one would expect it or like want to buy it necessarily so we're not sure how to market it but it's really good and beets have a very uh, low pH so they work yeah. for us um, so sometimes I think it, it's helped us in that way and then I think in a in addition to your point about like the particulates and the way it floats and stuff there's a lot of challenges with color so our number we're not as concerned about um floaters I, we like those especially because usually they're little pieces of herbs and that's like a little piece of our heart but the color is a challenge because color changes on a shelf over 18 months and our shelf life is 18 months yeah. and so the rhubarb for instance if you puree rhubarb and try to make a syrup your syrup is completely brown but if you are really, really careful about straining it, you get that beautiful rose kind of color. Yeah. And so that's, um, that's when we are still physically present every time we bottle. That's the reason why, because our co-packer will never be able to like quite manage that process for us. Right. Sure. So um, kind of just a brief aside slash quick question that was kind of led by your comment about being there when you're bottling. I was curious if you had any employees yeah. and if you don't, I think it's really great that when you finally have an employee or, you know, begin to hire an employee, you'll be able to ask them what your biggest weakness is and let them try and top your <laughs> biggest weakness turned into a strength, you know, yeah. story. That you I, I'm a firm believer that we don't have weaknesses. <laughs> Our weaknesses are our strengths. <laughs> and I'm and I've got like a list this long of our weaknesses. So that's why we're a partners. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't have employees yet. Um, we were actually set to have our first interns this summer on the cool. uh, we were gonna have like farm and com interns this year to help um, with both sides of the business, but with things being as they are, we're adjusting that a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk also, about. Also, I just want to note that we got lots of applications for calm interns, but none for farm interns. Yeah, no one wants to farm. <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> Speaking of which, on that note, um, Belinda, do you request syrups that you think would be great in cocktails, or Venice, do you say I'm making this cocktail? Figure out what to do with it. Syrup. I'm sorry, syrup. Um, yeah, I formulate the syrup recipes and then, and those have been basically set by our menu for the Happy Camper up until okay. this point. And so knowing what's been popular and has done really well there, then we'll figure out, okay, is that something we can feasibly grow here? What's the sourcing strategy for that? Um, for instance, you know, everyone wants a blue gin right now. I'm sure Alex knows, <laughs> like that, right? Um, so we do a lot of butterfly pea flower syrup for Happy Camper because we do a lot of weddings and they love the color changing and the trick and it's very fun. But we can't grow butterfly pea flower. We've tried it's for two really years. Hard. It's a I tropical mean, plant. Like it doesn't grow in Washington state. We don't like have blue houses, greenhouses to do it. So there's a balance there of what can we source locally that makes sense to grow in Washington state or buy from other producers in Washington state 
and what has been popular or easy to use in cocktail menus. Um, being a, it's a true simple syrup, so you guys combine it with just spirits, um, but you guys are probably also more spirit forward drinkers. Mm -hmm. um, for people who are mixing it, it is really nice that it's a one, one to one sugar to water ratio, true simple syrup, because like something like 60% of classic cocktail recipes incorporate a simple syrup or a grenadine. So right. after people learn how to make our basic recipe, which is like put this with booze and soda water and add a squeeze of lemon or lime, then you graduate to that next step where you're like, how do I turn this into a margarita? How do I turn this into a sidecar? How do I turn this into all of these other drinks, a Jack Rose? Like, what can I make with this that is, you know, an extension and it'll just basically make a blueberry lavender margarita, a rhubarb vanilla Jack Rose, and you're able to bring that craft cocktail experience home right. to the bar. In yeah, you house. know, I was, I was this close to making a gin flip tonight, but trying to crack an egg on camera and we, we might still get him get to do it. We might still get him to do and it. And then dry <laughs> shake it and not knock the table over and people need to learn how to dry shake if they don't know. We did a happy hour two weeks ago. So we've been doing these like garden happy hours where we teach people how to garden a little bit, take them through our process on the farm and then we make a drink. And I did a um like a like a gin fizz and so I did a dry shake and then I was shaking for a minute and I'm like shaking on camera and I was like, this was the worst idea because I can't talk while I shake because it's so loud. And I'm sitting here for a minute with just like dead air, which is, <laughs> you know, not generally recommended. So yeah, I don't recommend it. The cocktail was we'll, delicious though. We'll enjoy one after the, uh, after the, the tasting is done, I think. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. But for those of you who enjoy gin drinks, um, I really love any kind of gin flip with whatever you else you want to do with it because it really is just egg white on top of it. And I just feel like adding a little egg white to the top of any cocktail just brings that like texture and viscosity and like makes it so fun. Yeah. So next time you're making any kind of a gin drink, whether it's, you know, simple and doing what we did, which was a soda water, the syrups and gin, like dry shake an egg white and throw some on top. If, <laughs> you, if you love Negronis like we do, yeah, a Negroni too. flip. Yeah, for sure. I will also say that I was not a fan of gin at all until I was like in my 30s. And I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't even think I gave it a chance. Like I probably had one drink and was like, that was not good. Yeah. And um, we have a funny story about Jen because we took our little baby cousin, we're really close to our cousins, and we took her on her 21 run, and like the last drink, we're at the last bar, and we're like, okay, what do you want? And she just walks to the bar so confidently and is like, a shot of gin. And we're like, oh. oh. And it's the free shot. It's like the college bar that gives the free <laughs> shot on your 21st birthday, so you know the free shot of gin, like what, what she was in for. The only way to make that better is mix it half and half with Kahlua. Yeah. <laughs> we all just were like, we heard in our heads at the same time, like, dun, dun, dun. But she just like confidently took the shot and just walked away from the bar. And then we all, you know, being like 30 to 37, we were all just staring at her like, are you okay? You know, like, are, are you going to survive this? But now I absolutely love, like, gin is it was the worst. Life. It was the worst gin possible. Yeah. But now gin is my favorite. Like I have completely converted and gin is my cool. absolute favorite and I love it in our lemon herb because wow. with all those herbal botanicals and everything, it just kind of melds so easily. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big fan girl now. And, but also I am also a garnish snob because I grow garnishes a lot <laughs> of garnishes. Um, so two rules about so garnishes. I have 10 acres of beautiful garnishes. <laughs> exactly. So two rules about garnishes is that like they have to make sense with the drink and they have to be edible. Big, huge pet peeve. People who post social media posts, Instagram specifically, and that garnish is not edible. Like you wouldn't eat that. Right. Like don't do that. Um, but I, I do bring, sometimes I bring my own garnishes to bars. If like, especially if I'm going to a dive bar, wow, that's I will just slip like in some rosemary in my purse and I'll bring it because I love gin with rosemary. I don't know. It's like, yeah, a it is good. well, so, also at the dive bar, the people that are ordering drinks are often like sticking their fingers in the olives <laughs> and just like, <laughs> yes. gets a little floppy. Gross. It's funny when we were in Mexico um, or no, in Vietnam, actually recently, there was a drink that came out 
with a slice of aloe on it. Like, so you could see the aloe gel in the middle with the green on the outside. And we were both like, what do we do with this? Should we like <laughs> put it on our skin? Should we like, is it edible? Like, it was so strange, but it's cool. And I actually did end up putting it on my skin because I Had a little motorbike did what many people do uh, when they're on a, you know, a motorbike in on Vietnam. a dirt road <laughs> in a foreign country. So he literally took the aloe out of his cocktail and was like, put it on my road with rash. It. And I was just like, <laughs> like a that's... cocktail bar. And I was just like, what is happening? <laughs> I think that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for aloe. That's so funny. Um, we had a question come through about making the gin flip. Um, yeah, Belinda, you're Belinda, a you have cocktail a expert for that. How do you do so, that? What's your technique? Always a dry shake first. So only putting the egg white itself into the cocktail shaker. Also, egg whites at room temperature will shake and give you more foam than a cold egg. So take your egg out of the fridge a little bit earlier. Um, and then, so I dry shake just the egg white in the shaker for like 30 seconds, maybe even more, maybe like 45 seconds. It's a long time. You start, you start to get tired. And then you add your ice and the rest of your cocktail components into the shaker and you shake it again and you shake it again for like 30 seconds, 45 seconds. It's a long shake. Um, and once you've done that dry shake, it starts to build up the proteins in the eggs so that they foam really well. And when you add the ice, it has um, a chance of diluting the egg white and making that foam dissipate. So you want to make sure you get a really good shake when it's dry, then add your ice, shake it again, and then you strain it out and you'll get a really nice foam. But the best way in the step a lot of people miss is to wash your shaker with club soda. So like one ounce maximum of club soda poured into your shaker um, at the very end captures the rest of the foam that's clinging to the ice. Ah, cool. And that is what gives you like that last result to really build the foam up on that's a cocktail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's neat. I, I definitely know from, uh, recall from bartending that the dry shake was vital. That's interesting though, because I don't remember um, shaking the egg white solo. I remember kind of mixing the, the liquids together, leaving out the ice and shaking it. But uh, I can definitely see how just doing the egg and emulsifying that on its own mm -hmm. and then adding the rest of the liquids could definitely give it a little bit more thickness and density to the yeah. foam too. Yeah, and you can do it either way, but that's the way. Um, the other key that I found is small shaker. So a gin flip is not a, sh a, a cocktail where you need a large full-size shaker. Okay. And the way that you build foam is by activity of like this thing hitting the side of the shaker and then going back and hitting the side of the shaker again. And so the smaller size shaker, the less effort you have to put in for that action to take place. Sure. So a gin flip has so few ingredients that you can make even two or three at a time and build them in a small shaker and you're going to be able to fit it and, and get a lot more action in your shaker. So one of the things that I was thinking about doing with the flip, and it's an ingredient that I love in cocktails, but I don't find a lot of opportunity to use it, is basically doing uh, the Ivy City gin and the lemon herb with an egg and a little bit of olive oil. And I don't know if you've done much experimenting with olive oil in cocktails, but it's so good. I haven't done a lot of it with it like directly in cocktails, but fat washing cocktails is such a big thing right now. Ah, so I've done yeah. fat washed spirits. I haven't done it directly in, but that's interesting. I want, now I want to experiment. All right, everyone, we have about 10 minutes left of these makers time. Yeah, let's open it up to guys, your comments and, and, and questions and, you know, what you've, uh, what you've gleaned and what you might be uh, inspired to try at home. Or just general booze talk too, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to know something fun is that I actually, during this um, whole process, got a bottle of champagne delivered to my door. Oh, wow. Lovely. Yeah, from our local alcohol, like our local delivery. It's a it's a wine bar that can't have anyone come in right now, and so they're doing delivery. And so they texted me the ETA in the middle of this meeting, and I quickly had to text my husband upstairs, like, "Let the champagne in, pay for it, please." <laughs> Don't deny the bubbly. I love it. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Everyone just needs to survive right now, you know? So yeah. plus I feel really bougie having champagne delivered to my door. It feels very fancy. <laughs> Sometimes it's important to feel fancy, you know? It's good. Yes. yes. Yeah, I don't think that champagne needs to be pigeonholed into like celebrations. I actually feel like in some ways um, 
that was a pitfall of champagne's marketing is is that it's they made it meant so for fancy. celebrations like, yeah no it's good for breakfast yeah yeah is it end and why yeah you know i mean maybe not like champagne champagne that's expensive but I mean, bubbly if, certainly <laughs> if i had money falling out of my pockets yes, I said yeah. yes. I said yes. Yeah. someone on the chat was saying they've never heard of fat washing and so i just wanted to talk about that a little bit fat washing is um a really fun technique where you'll basically just like expose you don't let it sit there you don't let it um it's not like an infused spirit where you oftentimes are letting the infusion stay in for three four five days a week depending on what you're infusing into your spirit um but fat washing is literally they call it a wash because you put it in and then you strain it back out and so there's milk washed um spirits that are being made into cocktails there's um like coconut oil ones i mean you can anything that has fat in it i find the milk ones the most intriguing personally mm. um because that we've talked a lot about viscosity tonight and mouthfeel and you get this really creamy mouthfeel without needing an egg white is one of the ways that you can do that yeah. um and i had when i was in uh tennessee recently i went to there's, so we call ourselves garden to glass, um, being a farm to bar concept. That's kind of the term we've come to use. And in hashtagging that on social media over and over again, we found a guy who is actually has written a book about garden to glass and he bartends in a bar in Tennessee. His name is Mike and his, um, his book, if anyone's interested, is called garden to glass. And um, his drink was like a, a very old fashioned type drink would be like a whiskey milk punch. That was like a, like a 1900s, like Victorian kind of era drink. Um, and he made basically a modern version of that by fat washing the um, whiskey and then making this really beautiful. It actually had a violet syrup in it. Um, it was so good. So it's wow. definitely kind of on the fringes of cocktailing, but it, it's a fun thing to try it at your local bar. If they offer it, try it. Nice. Um, yeah, if I can just jump in real quick. Yeah, please. A couple things about the fat washing. Uh, I've done a cocktail. I did it again um, for video things for the distillery uh, this weekend. Um, we do an olive oil wash on our vodka uh, for a dirty martini. So with the brine from the olives as well and the richness oh. from the olive oil. But the way we did it, or the way I did it, is uh, mix the vodka at about six to one proportions to olive oil. Just shake it up in a small Tupperware for four or five hours. You're not shaking constantly. Revisit every couple hours, whatever. And then put it in the freezer overnight. The olive oil will separate. And then you just have to break a little hole in it, pour off the vodka through a, like a coffee filter. And it adds some nice flavor, a little bit of richness from the, the oil as well. I want and, that uh, to just, uh, happening in our home, Evan. Oh, that's I, I'm, I'm delegating this to him. I'm like, that, I want that happening here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds absolutely. real fun. And then of course, you know, if you want to go real decadent, bacon fat for a whiskey. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, that we, was my first experiment with, with fat washing. I, I put a few pieces of cooked bacon um, in a jar with some rye whiskey and left it overnight, put it in the freezer because that was the easiest way to get the fat out of there. Yeah. And then made a Manhattan with maple syrup and it was like the perfect breakfast cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> also to uh, uh, Venice's point uh, earlier about rosemary combination, my favorite way to, you know, do a, a truly like Spanish gin tonic, uh, you know, big goblet, with our Ivy City Gin is uh, to add a lot of rosemary, uh, grapefruit, like not just the peel, like a whole big wedge of grapefruit in there. And if you want, you know, some peppercorns to spice it up a little. I love the Spanish style gin tonica. Yeah. It's so fun. Yeah. Big old goblet. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, we had a question here. Um, Belinda, how would you make a margarita style drink with one of your syrups? Yeah, I, I was trying to answer it and then I accidentally answered it privately, but um, it's similar to why it tastes so good with whiskey and bourbons, the caramelization that happens with those spirits. Um, rhubarb vanilla is excellent with the caramelization that happens when you toast agave to make tequila. Cool. So we love our rhubarb vanilla margaritas. And I also mm -hmm. love the added component of doing a mix of tequila and mezcal in a rhubarb vanilla margarita. Adds a fun, like smoky, sweet, vanilla, delicious thing that 
It's just so Linda, good. You're, you're making people dance with your answer. They're <laughs> excited about this. <laughs> uh, yeah, so th that one's great. Um, also, lavender and tequila have a weird but fun relationship, um, and lime is essential to marry those two, but I like blueberry lavender um, and a lot of fresh lime. You can only use fresh lime. Do not try to use a margarita mixer at all, um, but the blueberry lavender is a fun, different tequila, and you want to make sure you have a really mild tasting, um, like silver tequila with that, um, whereas the rhubarb vanilla, you can get kind of toasty, or you can use a reposado or something if you want okay. to. So it's interesting. So for those of you who like tequila and mezcal, we have um, a mezcal event coming up on May 7th, two mm -hmm. days after Cinco de Mayo. So we have two mezcal producers um, with three different mezcals that we'll be featuring. Yeah. Um, and so maybe we'll play around and that would be do fun. a little cocktail with one of these. Yeah. And then also with 1A Distilling, we also, we were just talking about their whiskey. We have their bourbon and rye here as well. So we're going to be doing another future event with them. So if you love their gins and you like what you hear about what they're doing, make sure to join us for our future yeah. event. It's not on the calendar quite yet, but we're getting it on there. Um, and sneak peek, they're also amazing. Oh my gosh, the bourbon is so good. <laughs> yeah, the bourbon and the rye are so good, yummy. So yeah, so you can jump online and get the bourbon and rye from um, the District Made 1-8 now and be prepared. And um, I'd also like to point out something that's just fun to say, which is rhubarb marg. Rhubarb marg. <laughs> rhubarb like marg. It. That is, yeah, that's got a, it's got a yeah, good ring. Rhubarb marg. So, although although, the, you although that, the more you have of them, the less likely it might you be hard say to that. say. <laughs> Still fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, we want to be respectful of everyone's time, but um, so we are at 7.30. Evan and I are always happy to hang out and chit chat for a little while longer. And if the makers would like to as well, um, we'd love to have you. Or but we also, we also know everyone has lives and things to do. Of course. Um, but yeah, we have a super great calendar events coming up. So make sure to check that out. Next week is Pinot Noir with Whetstone Wine Cellars and Carpenter, Carpenter. Wines. Then we have the mezcal tasting we were talking That's about. Erstwhile and Los Nahuales, uh mezcal. Um, and there's a really great discount on one of them as well. Yeah. It's kind of a, like a smoking deal because they're pricey mezcals, but they're a good deal. And then also um, summer sip and ciders. So we're doing another cider event with Hemley Ciders and um, Seattle, Seattle Cider, cider Company. Company. And those are pretty fun. We have a jalapeno cider, a grapefruit cider. Um, so some really fun kind of summer cool ciders. Stuff. Um, but thank, thank you, you from coast to, to coast, guys. from Washington yeah. to Washington, yes, DC to state. Um, it's I been didn't pick up on that until just now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and everyone, let's raise another glass and give them another cheers. Although I'm a little low on my drink. There we go. Yeah, I'll use that. I've got a little left in that one. Cheers, cheers everyone. Thank cheers. you. Guys. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. So much fun. Cheers.